Hey, good morning. I, I want to do something as I get going this morning, if it's okay with you. I would love, I did it with the early service, and I think it's uh, important even in this gathering uh, to pray for those in Louisiana on the coast, if we could do that. It is, uh, so right on the edge of Category 5 uh, hurricane, and so 16 years to the day of Katrina. And so I would love if we just kind of start and, and pray uh, for the folks on the coast down there uh, in Louisiana. Would, would you join me? Let's pray. Father, we love you, and um, we call on you, the creator of the universe, um, the God of heaven and earth. Nothing escapes you. Nothing escapes you. Uh, not this hurricane that's happening. And Father, if we are honest with you as your children, we don't get tragedy Sometimes we just don't get it. We don't get loss of life. We don't get um, sometimes how this stuff can happen under your watch and the care. And, but, Father, in that, we trust you. We know you're sovereign. You're in control. You know everything. And you've got a plan, and you're working it, and so we're trusting you. But right now, we just ask for mercy and for grace and for protection and that you would be the great rescuer and you would uh, help people get out of harm's way. And, and then, Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters in Jesus that are down in that area. I pray that you would um, raise them up and, and you would equip them. You would uh, work through them to bring the light of Jesus to this, um, to this part of our country over the next couple weeks and months as there's recovery and people without power and people without food in the heat. And Father, I just pray um, that you would use our brothers and sisters and however we could uh, partner with them to help the people in that region. And, and Father, we know that you are a God of love, a God who cares deeply about all of this. And so that's why we're coming to you and giving it to you and trusting you with it. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for, for joining me and doing that. Uh, so when you, when you just stop for a minute and think about the human body, you have to be blown away with how it's put together. Now, I'm not talking about like for you right now, you're like, well, listen, Paul, I looked in the mirror this morning and I'm not really happy with what I see, all right, or the shape you're in or whatever. I'm not talking about that, all right? That's a you thing. That's a you problem. For, I'm just talking about the human body in general, and how it's put together. Like one organism, but made up of billions of parts, from cells to tissues to organs and, and systems. We have these 11 systems in our body that all work seamlessly together, right? The, the, the skeletal and muscular and cardiovascular and nervous, and I'm not gonna keep going, but you get the idea, right? So you, you have these systems that work, and listen, there have been volumes written to, to try and explain and explore all the intricacies of the human body. We're ridiculous. We are a ridiculous creation. Now, like, let me, let's just take one, one example, right? One instance, since we're right in the middle of COVID, how your body responds to a virus, right? So within each of us, well, well first we go to the doctor, right, and they... They, they ask us or they want to take our temperature first thing. You come in, they want to take your temperature. You ever wonder why they want to take your temperature? Obviously, they can tell if something's going on with you. But within each one of us, we have a part of our brain called the hypothalamus. And it's constantly regulating our temperature so that, that our body is in the optimal position for all of our, all, all of our body functions. Right? It's somewhere between 97 and 99 degrees. We're like walking climate-controlled people, if you think about it that way. And, and so when, a, when the immune system detects a virus, it sends a signal to the hypothalamus saying, hey, you got to heat some stuff up, causing a fever, right? This hot and, and hostile environment that weakens the virus and then it stimulates the immune response. Is that amazing? That's just one part of your brain, of all of the parts of your body. 
And when you think about that, that just gives us a glimpse, just a small glimpse of this amazing, infinite intellect of our Heavenly Father that created us. It just shows us a little glimpse of, of Him. We are amazing creatures. And here's what's amazing to me, that God uses the human body to describe us, the church. He describes the church using metaphor of, of the human body. And there are other metaphors in Scripture that, we, that, that are used, like the family. Right? We've been using that a lot at Seven Marks and reconnecting people and after COVID. Uh, the bride of Christ, the, the house of God, uh, the, the, the temple of God, like we're living stones. So those are all metaphors in the New Testament used about the church. But, but the metaphor of the body, I think, speaks clear, so clearly to the last word in our mission statement, together. So we're in week two of a four-week series called Practicing the Way of Jesus Together, celebrating kind of the official launch of seven marks. And so Practicing the Way of Jesus Together is also the mission statement of seven marks. And we began to unpack that a little bit last week. And we said that our mission statement comes directly from Jesus himself. It's worded a little bit differently, but we didn't create the church, so we don't get to create the mission statement. We say it different. Different churches say it differently, but we simply follow our leader, Jesus, who gave us the mission of making disciples. And so when Jesus came to the planet and he started his ministry, he invited people to follow him. And, and to practice his way of life. And when people began to do that, what that meant was that they would, they would abide in him, they would be with him, they would align their life to him and his teaching and believe in him, and then as a result, they would act out on his words. Like they, they, would, they would perform or they would follow his activity. So, so they didn't just say it, they, they went for it. Right? And we know that they, they weren't perfect. Right? They weren't perfect. They were, they were a work in progress. We looked a little bit at that last week. But after a while, we see as a result of being with Jesus, their lives changed. And we're sitting in this room or watching online as a result of them carrying out the mission that Jesus gave them. And so it's the same pattern for us. If we're going to practice the way of Jesus, then we're going to abide in him we're going to align our life with his teaching, believe in him, and we are going to act on his words. And when we do that, then we are marked as disciples who find their identity in Jesus and they pursue Jesus' lifestyle and they respond to the Holy Spirit and they engage in biblical community and they serve others and they proclaim Jesus with their mouth and they make disciples. But here's something. Here's something that cannot be overlooked in the early church. It cannot be ignored. The mission that Jesus gave, he did not give to an individual. He gave it to a group of people. So, so if seven marks is going to effectively accomplish the mission of Jesus in Raleigh, it's going to take all of us practicing the way of Jesus, not only individually, but together. In fact, our growth as disciples, listen, our growth as disciples is absolutely 100% dependent on our engagement with one another. Let me show you what I mean. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so we've been in, this is another letter that Paul wrote, one of his longer letters, and we've looked at several of Paul's letters. And this particular letter to the church of Corinth, he had been there for about a, he, he was there for a year and a half. So he planted the church, established it, made some great relationships, spent plenty of time there, but then he left. And as we have seen with other letters, he hears about something going, back, uh, going on back in Corinth, and he writes a letter to address it. And what he heard was there were some problems, not unlike some of the problems that are in our modern day church. There were divisions, there were factions, there were differences of opinion, there was gross sexual sin, and, and, and the believers were differing on how they thought about all of this stuff. 
And so Paul writes this letter and he appeals to them for unity. Like coming around the name of Jesus. Not a person, not a practice, but coming around the name of Jesus. And, and the part of the letter that we're going to read, chapter 12, deals with how is the church supposed to operate when they come together? And we're not going to get into the specifics. We don't have time. But Paul basically says this. When you come together with the body, don't make it about you. Don't come with your own agenda. Uh, don't make yourself out to be better than other people. And, and then don't come flippantly into the gathering together. Instead, understand that. Like, come with understanding. Come with love. I, I find it interesting that when you go to a wedding, uh, you often hear the reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, right? Everybody likes to read some portion of the love chapter. You know, the love chapter is mentioned right here in the body in the context of how the body is supposed to operate. Paul says there's a greater way here, and it's love. So when you come, under, come with understanding, come with love, knowing that you need each other. You're going to need each other to practice the way of Jesus effectively. Now, is it all right if I challenge you before I get into this reading? Like, can I come with some, just a couple hard statements? Are you okay with that? Yeah, some of you are scared right now, and you're like, I don't know, I don't know if I want you to. Um, look, in our modern day culture, in our modern day culture, um, the church seems to be minimized and dumbed down a little bit. So, the church wasn't established. Listen, the church wasn't established so we have somewhere to go on Sunday morning. Okay, you tracking with me? It wasn't established so we have somewhere to go or somewhere to tune in online, either on the weekend or during the week. The church was established to accomplish the mission. That's why it was accomplished. It was accomplished because of and in accordance with the mission that Jesus gave for us to carry out. And so nowadays, the church is kind of dumbed down to where it's become a place of goods and services, where, where you come on the weekend or you tune in for a message and some music, and if you don't like the message, if you don't like the music, if you don't like the pastor, if you don't like the people, kids ministry, student ministry, something happens, there's a lot of other churches, so we'll just go to another place with goods and services that might be a little bit better. Instead of, listen... Instead of looking at the church as this mobilized group of people that are doing absolutely everything that they can while they're on the planet to accomplish the mission that Jesus gave us. Like, look, you, you have to understand this. You have to understand this. That we are this interdependent, interconnected organism that was meant for mission. We were meant for more than Sunday morning. Look how Paul says it, and he says it this way in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And, and I would love for you, like circle, the, the time, circle every time you, you see the word one in, in your Bible. If you're doing this on your mobile device, that's harder. But anyway, for, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink one of one spirit. All right, now time out. Like, look at this. So when you and I come into relationship with Jesus, when, when we look to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, we believe in his death, burial, and resurrection and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? And, and, and he enters into our life. He gives us the Holy Spirit who includes us and indwells us and we become one body. You're one. So, so if you're a follower of Jesus, we are one body. That's what Paul is saying here. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many, all of us. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would, make, that would not make it any less 
a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts don't, need, don't require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be no divisions in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one suffers, we all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So Paul talks, he just, he just jumps right into the disunity in the church. And, and, he, and he uses this metaphor of the body to magnify the importance of unity and community and how we relate to one another. And he begins by saying, look, we're a lot, there's, there's a lot of us here and watching online, but we are one. Everyone in the body matters. So what does that mean? That means there are no less thans. There are no less thans in the body. And then the opposite is true. So then there are no better thans in the body. We are, everybody matters. And there are different parts, and we see it in this text, that are treated differently, some that need more grace, some that need more sensitivity and care, but it doesn't make them any less important or any more important. I love how Paul starts this letter out to the, to the church of Corinth. He says this in the first chapter, verse 26, for consider your calling. Consider when you came to Jesus. Not many of you were wise, that's my, that's my, according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful, that's me. Not many of you were of noble birth, that's me. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, to confuse, to confound the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that, watch this, no human being might boast in the presence of God. Jesus levels the playing ground in his family. He levels the playing ground. He he chooses the most unlikely, ordinary people, and the boasting should never be about what a particular person, you or me, brings to the body because we know that it's Jesus that holds the body together and advances the body. Like some, some plants, some water, but it's God that gives the increase. He's placed us where he's placed us, listen, to accomplish his mission like everyone matters. Every gifting in this body matters. Every act, of, uh, every act in this body matters. Every word of encouragement matters. It all matters. God has so designed this particular body. Seven marks. He has so designed this particular body so that who you are in the seat, watching online, and what you contribute matters. We all matter. By design, listen, by design you belong. Some of you need to hear that. Spoke to a gentleman a few weeks ago. Grown man. Said to me, I just want to feel like I belong. If you're part of the family of God and you are in this room watching online, by design you belong. You belong. But belonging is not it. That's not all. That's not all there is. Like we, look, I've been in church my whole life. We, we see churches all over the globe where they have this huge inflated church membership. How many, how many members are at your church? Mm, I don't know, maybe about 2,000 or so. Really? How many, are coming in, how, how many come on the weekend? I don't know, maybe 100, 200, something like that. Right? The Pareto principle is alive and well in the church too, where 20% of the people 
right, carry out 80% of the mission. They're doing 80% of the work. You have 20% of the people that are, that are taking care of 80% of the funds of the mission. And you have 20% of the people that are actually engaging in the city, in, in mission to the city. Right? So, it's, so belonging, is, that's part of it. It's, it's important for us to understand that we belong to this. But when you practice the way of Jesus, not, does only, not, a, not a, only does everyone matter, everyone is needed. Everyone's needed. Everyone matters. Everyone is needed. Paul writes, for the body does not consist of one member but of many. And one part of the body cannot say to the other part, I have no need of you. <laughs> I've heard often in my years as a pastor, when I'm having a conversation with somebody, they're like, nah, I really don't need community. Oh, okay. And so I want to say you're dead wrong. You're absolutely wrong. I'm nice. I don't. But the fact is that you are wrong. You, need, you were built for relationship. You were made for relationship. You were made to be in relationship. If God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are in community. And then you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter one, right, when God created Adam and he saw him there and he said, you're alone. He, that's not good. That's not good for you to be alone. We were made for community. But here's something else. If you are an independent disciple, you are dead in the water. You're dead in the water. Paul, like, what do you mean? Well, let's just use the metaphor. Let's just use the metaphor that God is using in the scripture about the body. All right, so let's just say, I'm not gonna do this, but I would sever my left arm. I would just take, I'd just take it off, and I just threw it over there on the platform. And I said, hey, just do your own thing. Go ahead, have a good life. Hope things work out for you. That's not happening, right? The arm cannot exist without the body. Cannot. It, it, it cannot. It, it will die. It, it's, it's not useful. In, this, in the same way that my body needs the arm, right, you, you need the body. You need other people to help you practice the way of Jesus. And what's important is I need the arm. Like the body needs the arm. Right? And, and, and so the body needs you. You're the only you. You have, a, you have a distinct set of gifts and abilities and stuff that you offer and that you contribute. So let me ask you, what are you contributing to this body? Seven marks. What gifting are you contributing? What are you lending? What are you lending to the body for the purpose of the mission? Accomplishing this. That's what we're about. We're about accomplishing the mission. We were made for more than Sunday morning. We were made to accomplish a mission. So what are you doing to contribute? Because if you're a part of this local body, you belong. Like you belong, but also it's not optional for you. This body needs you. And here's, here's, here's a reason why it needs you is because, number three, when you practice the way of Jesus together, everyone is transformed. Just remember when we were growing up, we, our parents were like, we were always watching who we hung with. It was very care, they were, hey, you gotta, you gotta be careful about who you're hanging with. Like, you can't hang with those people. No, you can't hang with them, you can't. And so we were trying to protect, right? Or they were trying to protect. Now as parents, we try and protect. We're like, no. You can't hang out with them. In fact, we open our houses so that their friends come to our house so we can check out their friends, right? To make sure that their friends are okay before we say you can hang out with them. Why? Because we know that relationships shape people. We know that. Right? Just, just stop for a minute and look back and you can just start quickly thinking about the relationships in your life that have shaped you, some good, some bad. But in the same way, there are, there are letters that Paul writes that talk about how the body, the body of Christ, the church, helps transform you into the image of Jesus. He says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he, Jesus, the leader of the church, gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints, that's you, 
for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all, all the members, none of us, me, you, nobody's arrived yet, attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We know him and we, we know who we are in him. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Man, we find our identity in Jesus. And when we get there, I mean, we, we are solid. We are planted solid so that... We may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love. Don't miss this picture. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped. Does that ring a bell from last week, right? Jesus, when we stand in Jesus, he holds us together individually, but then he holds us together corporately as a church. And when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul's saying, man, there is a shaping power. There is a shaping power to community when we come together together as the body of Jesus, practicing the way of Jesus together. It doesn't happen outside of that. Yes, do you need your individual practices, solitude, spending time in the word, and you are practicing those rhythms of, of Jesus? Those are, those are incredibly important, but discipleship is not a solo endeavor. You are kidding yourself if you think you can go without community, without other followers of Jesus speaking into your life and rubbing shoulders with you on a consistent basis. Uh, this past week, Martha and I re-engaged with our Seven Mark community. And for most of the night, and for those, I have some of the community that are in here, uh, you will know this, I just observed. I just observed, I watched. And what amazed me was just watching the relationships that have happened over the past year. Um, And much of it was because of the commitment just to keep showing up, whether it was through Zoom from COVID or in person or taking trips or whatever. They just kept showing up. And it it was so amazing to watch how in that community, they just accepted each other for who they were. Just They just accepted each other. And where they were in their relationship with Jesus. Some are further along than others. Some are smarter than others. Didn't matter. Some, they they knew, like, I don't know what I'm saying here, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it anyway. You know, transformation, listen. Transformation has four components. Love, grace, truth, and time. I love you enough to accept you just the way you are. But I love you enough to challenge you to grow, to be more like Jesus. And I love you enough that I am going to give you my most valuable commodity, my time. And after a while, just showing up, you see how transformation happens. So how do, you practically, how do you practically practice the way of Jesus together at Seven Marks? Because if everybody matters, right, and everyone is needed, and transformation happens in community, how do we do this together? And so I'm gonna give you five, five ways here at Seven Marks you can do that. Now, I debated. I was like, just give them one. Five is just going to dilute everything. But I don't want you to have an excuse. Right? So when you walk out of this room, there are five different, there are five different ways you can do it. And it everyone in the room, everyone watching online, you can find one. Here's one. Use your gifting to serve the body. Now I grew up in a large family. So we did everything, like mow the grass, clean the dishes. It's one of six kids, so eight of us um, chopping wood. So our, our home was partially heated by the fireplace, and so 
always chopping wood, carrying wood, hated it, absolutely hated it. But looking back now, I can honestly say I could have done more. You know, as an adult, you look back, you know, I could have done more. And <laughs> I could have done it with a better attitude, <laughs> too. Right? So what are you, where are you throwing in here? It's straight up. Where are you throwing in? How, how are you contributing to the mission? For some of you, you don't know where to start. For some, maybe you're, a little, you're still concerned about COVID. And Look, there's, there's a spot for everybody to engage their gifting. So if you, if you need help figuring that out, then just, just communicate with us. Or use the QR code. And everything I'm going to say, you can use the QR code and seat back in front of you. And let's talk about how you can contribute to this body of people. Right, on October 3rd, we're gonna have this big party here for those who have been serving for the past year. We're a year now, we're a year in since we opened our building after COVID. And there have been some great servant leaders that have been throwing in for a year. So we're just gonna party and celebrate them. And if you're trying to figure out where, where to engage, man, I'd love for you to be part of that party just to see who we are, what we're about, and engage and partner. Two, become part of a seven mark community. I just mentioned our community and there's only so much that can happen in this room. Right? Hopefully you're inspired, you're encouraged, but there's only so much that can happen in here and, and for you to be known and to know other people. And so the seven mark communities are around the city and they're designed to help you know each other. And you're like, well, I looked, there's none that fit me, there's nowhere for me to go, I can't find any. Well then create one. Get some people that you know, start having dinner. That's it, just start having dinner together, right, on a, on a regular uh, occurrence or coffee or something like that. And then allow the discipleship team to help you form the community from that. Okay, but we, we will help you. And then here's three. If, if that doesn't work for you, jump into one of our seven mark cohorts. Like I mentioned this last week. Like my desire is for anyone who calls seven marks home to go through, a co go, to go through the seven marks cohort, either virtually or, or in person. Okay, and so they start September 12th. So if you don't know anybody, no groups fit you, this is perfect. Because you'll get to be part of a cohort, you'll start to meet people, and then maybe a community develops out of that. Force, come to starting points. So some of you are brand new to Seven Marks. You don't know us, you don't know me, you don't know our leadership team, you don't know anybody. And so starting point, we had it prior to COVID, we haven't had it since we launched that on September 12th. It's in between the gatherings from 10.15 to 11, so it catches those from the nine o'clock hour and 11 o'clock hour, and you can come and hang out, learn about us, ask whatever questions you want. All right, so maybe that's a move for you. Fifth, engage in one of our city initiatives. Before COVID started, um, we came together as a staff and we identified, there's so many needs in the city, but we identified six areas, six city initiatives. And it started to gather a little bit of steam. And then we have people from the body who became a champion of each of these city initiatives. So we have six champions that started to build a team. And then we, we had sign-ups. And people started to sign up. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. I would love that city initiative. And then COVID happened. And it shut it all down. And we lost all of the momentum of our city initiative. Well, since we started, we're starting to crank up and, and get some momentum for those city initiatives. And so what you could do using that QR code is you can go onto our site and you can simply fill out that form and, and that city initiative, or that city champion will call you or communicate with you about how you can jump in to those city initiatives. So that's five areas real quick, all right? So you can pick one of those. And as I close, I wanna just talk about this building for a second. So as a leadership team moving forward, our desire is for you to be the people of God. As Josh said earlier, to be bold about your faith, courageous, and share Jesus with people. But not only do we want you to be a people of God, we wanna use this building to be a building of God. And so um, our desire is, is to use this building to strategically introduce people to Jesus. As I said last week or the week before, most, most non-followers of Jesus are not coming here on a Sunday morning. They're just not coming into the room. Some will, but most of them will not. So we're gonna try and figure out creative ways 
to interact with people who don't know Jesus using this building and share this building so it's shared use with our body and the community. So this past week I met with a couple who own a company, a design company, and they donated hours and hours of time, thousands of dollars they donated to come up with a new design for our lobby and Studio One. And so they, they revealed those to me on Friday. I wanted to show you just a couple glimpses of that this morning. And I'm so excited, not just for this body of people, but for our city. Like we are gonna continually figure out how to use this building to rub shoulders with people that don't know Jesus. Having business events that come in here and use the building and, 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 they, and, and we roll out the red carpet for them and we show them the love of Jesus. And so we're gonna start on this project in the, in the coming weeks and, and we're gonna use as much as we can from in-house. And so if you have expertise, look, I'm not talking about if you can swing a hammer, okay? That's not the kind of expertise I'm looking for. I'm looking for professionals, all right? Like professionals, they know what the heck they're doing. We're gonna try and do most of this from in-house, save funds, be fiscally responsible, and I'll talk a little bit more about this next week and how we're using the building, but because we're gonna be outside next week, we won't have these screens, so I wanted to show you a few images. But as I started, I, look, I stated that we were made. We were made for more than Sunday. We were made to accomplish a mission. We were invited into a mission. And everybody matters. And everybody is needed. And when we're together, man, we are, we are being transformed into the image of Jesus. And the end result is that we become a church that doesn't just show up. We become a church that gets it done. 